Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode 216, recorded Monday, September 14th, 2015. Jenny Jardin. Triangulation is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron will send you all the ingredients to cook fresh, delicious meals with simple step-by-step -step instructions right to your door. See what's on the menu this week and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's blueapron.com slash twit. And by the Ring Video Doorbell. With a built-in HD camera and microphone, you can monitor your front door from anywhere in the world using your smartphone. It's like being home even when you're not. Right now, get $10 off the Ring Video Doorbell when you go to ring.com slash triangulation. And by Wealthfront. Wealthfront is a low-cost automated investment service that is the most sophisticated way for you to invest your money. Whether you've got millions or you're just starting out, visit Wealthfront.com slash triangulation to sign up and get your free personalized investment portfolio. That's Wealthfront.com slash triangulation. All right. Hi, Leo. Hi. Jenny Jardin on the line. I'm so happy to talk to you, Jenny. Uh, I'm happy to be here. I'm, I'm sitting here from my uh, Yeti-lined lair. In, you look so cool. You look so cool there. You look both... Uh, hip, artistic, and digital, kind of all meshed into one with the Time, time Life uh, headsets you're wearing. It's very good. These are great headsets that your people sent. <laughs> yes, I, I didn't have to worry about my hair because I knew it would all be smushed. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. It's great to see you. Life's too short to worry about. I want to. This is right going to be, and I hope you. It, it, I would just want to say up front, if I ask anything that's too personal, you just shut me down and say no. Too personal. Sure. Okay. But I, but I want to know about you, because we know of you. We've all been reading Jenny in uh, Boing Boing for some time. One of the founding partners of Boing Boing, the fabulous. It was originally a zine, but fabulous uh, digital uh, blog of everything interesting in the world. Um, but I want to go back farther than that. I want to ask why Monica and Glenn named you Jenny. Oh wow, um, they didn't. Uh, I. The name I was born with was Jennifer Lorraine Ham. And uh, in my teens, I ended up, um, my dad died. He was a, a genius, genius artist who was also um, had some untreated mental health problems and some untreated addiction problems. And he died when I was very young. He died when I was 10. Mm. And um, Oh, that's devastating. I, I ended up uh, on the streets at, a, at an early age. I um, had uh, a lot of really rough experiences out in the world when I was in an age that uh, it's way too young to handle that kind of stuff. How did that happen? Um, well, you know, I just want to address the name thing real quickly. So okay. um, I, I was on the street, you know, off and on from the time that I was like 14 onward. Shimmy. And when I was... Um, it was when I was 18, I met a, a very um, charismatic man who presented himself as a kind of a spiritual teacher and became part of, uh, of what felt like a family. And it was a, um, I think it's fair to call it a cult. And uh, in that, in that uh, experience, you know, I ended up spending a lot of time in Guatemala and in uh, from Native American communities. This man was Native American. And he, I, I accompanied him on a, a trip to Guatemala to meet traditional Mayan priests, you know, who practice the, the day keeping and the, the traditional um, calendrical system. It, this man was, um, he was like a, a kind of Latino Chicano uh, theater person who had found a, a second calling basically studying indigenous spirituality. So I went with him to Guatemala when I was, it was either 18 or 19. I, it was my first year uh, in San Francisco. I made my way out to San Francisco and uh, met him and, you know, really 
it was it I I hadn't had a family for a really long time, and this, you know, a cult can really feel like a family. Uh, we went to Guatemala during the war. There was a a 36 year war in civil war in Guatemala, uh, backed by the U.S. The Guatemalan government and and military were basically waging war on indigenous people and uh, on students and labor activists and stuff. But it was really a genocidal war primarily against indigenous people, um, I believe, to gain control of the land so that things that are happening now, American and Canadian owned mines coming in and stripping the land of its value could happen. But at that time, it was 88, 89. the, uh, The genocidal war was in full swing. And the government was actively, you know, bombing Native American communities, uh, especially in the the northern part of Guatemala. And, you know, here I was, a, um, you know, an untreated alcoholic and drug addict who was dry because part of being in the cult was that you needed to be dry. Uh, 18, 19 years old, never been out of the country in my life, tagging along with this highly charismatic, very, very unusual man um, to... Native American villages in Guatemala. And when I was there, I got very, very sick off of, um, you know, water, food or whatever. It was in the middle of a war. And we were staying with very poor people whose, some of whom had had just, uh, you know, like the village next door was raised and everybody killed. And we were staying in like the village that survived. Wow. I got really sick. And I remember I was, was like lying in some back room of a hut somewhere you know, just puking and crapping my guts out. And this Jeez. little, this, this little kid, these, these little babies, it was a Kakchi Maya village. These little cute little babies were kind of peering over the side of the bed like this, just staring at me for hours. And one of them was this sweet little boy with like, they call them mocosos. It means like snotties. <laughs> they had like snot coming out of his face. <laughs> and he said, what's your name? Tu nombre, tu nombre, like that. What's your name? And I said, it's Jennifer. <laughs> and he, in in Kachikel, the way they would uh, translate that, like if you're a toddler who doesn't speak really Spanish or English, is Shenny Flores. Oh. So it was like Shenny Flores, and it was such a cute little portmanteau. Flores means Flores means flowers. And my name became Shenny Flores or Shenny for short. Everybody started calling me that. And it became like my, the the man who is the leader of this um, cult said, you know, that's, that's your name now. And that was really cool. And he gave me a last name too, because nobody in my family was using my dad's name anymore. It was cool because I had an identity. Wow. Yeah. So that's where the name came from. I've actually never talked publicly about that. And, um, you know, maybe it's too much, but. That's a great I'm also, story. I'm, I'm also kind of sick of people saying like, you made up your name because it just seems like, like I, it was just, it was so much cooler and more yeah. random than that. <laughs> it's, a, it's a wonderful story. <laughs> I noticed you don't want to say the name of the cult leader. How'd, no. you, how'd you get out of that? Well, you know, I'm not really ready to, um, Go to deep. talk a whole right. lot about that. That was all pretty, pretty recent. Um, but you know, it wasn't, um, it's, I, it's just really important for my own recovery to be able to leave that behind. I don't, I you. don't know where those people are. Yeah. I don't want to know. I don't want to have anything mm-hmm. to do with them. I, um, you know, for 20, 25 years of my life, I basically gave, wow. handed, handed every paycheck over to this person. And that, that kind of, you know, intense control, it was a, a very abusive very, very bad situation in many respects. But, um, you know, I I was exposed to a lot of really cool stuff too. So life is complicated. And when you come from a home where there's a lot of abuse and a lot of uh, violence and a lot of unpredictability, as is common in homes where there is, um, you know, advanced alcoholism and uh, untreated, probably bipolar, which is probably what my dad had. And, and, you know, a mom who... um, who didn't know that she uh, didn't have to put up with violent abuse every day. When you come from that kind of environment, um, your self-worth is really, really damaged. And 
it seems absolutely normal to walk into a situation where you can count on being abused and yeah. being treated as, as absolutely worthless. And it was, it was a big step up from the kind of crap I was doing on the street when I was younger. But you just so. think that's normal. That's the norm. Yeah, you don't know any better. And you might even, I think, sometimes think you deserve it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that the reason that, um, you know, you're getting hit in the face when you do something wrong is because that's what you deserve. You're, you're a bad enough person that you deserve yeah. to be hit. A lot of a lot of us women who come from homes where that was the norm and that was the way of solving problems, you know, we find ourselves in situations where where we're being physically abused, financially abused, sexually abused, verbally abused, and emotionally abused. And it, you know, I'm I'm just super stoked to be out of that. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Hard thing to and, get and out to, of. Though. And to have a sense of of slowly developing sense of true self worth. Mm. Like there's a difference between. Um, the kind of posturing that so many of us do on social media and a true sense of, of deep self-worth. Deep self-worth is, uh, is something that allows us to give and receive real love and real compassion and really be of service to other people. And that's very different than thinking, you know, I'm because I have a hundred thousand Twitter followers or whatever, you know, the kind of, the kind of, um, narcissistic metrics that, drive so much of our lives, we who work online. It's really interesting because uh, my experience of you is as this <clears throat> deeply grounded, centered, rooted person, and almost the kind of person hey, I would say, maybe I, I don't know you that well. It's really but, nice. <laughs> but that's You're the sense. You're so kind. Thank you. That's the sense you get. And at the same time, you don't think of those kinds of people as being... Uh, technology mavens and involved in things like Boing Boing and living la vida digitales or whatever they call it. That's great. And so well, you've I'm combined. I'm going to change my Twitter bio. <laughs> living la vida digitales. I'm in a Federico with Sona Power. Eating my homemade pasta. Yes, yeah, see, see. Hey, yeah. So it's an interesting, almost uh, paradoxical life you lead. You live li a life online, and yet it seems like you might eschew that normally. Um, you know, I, I grew up very isolated. Um, I can't get my camera straight. Whoops. <laughs> I, I grew up in some ways very isolated. Uh, I lived in a, a home that was physically isolated uh, with two people who were uh, professional artists and who worked in the arts. There was a lot of just intense, genius-level creativity around us and your father was quite a famous painter not famous but he was a genius and he he wrote a book uh called painting the nude he specialized um in the 70s like you do right <laughs> in, in in painting female nudes and in fact our home uh one of the reasons that i i think i was socially isolated is this was in richmond virginia which was then uh, an even more conservative and racially divided city, mm. very, very culturally conservative. And here I had this, um, you know, very eccentric dad who, like, you know how I'm an authenticity masochist with tortillas and soda bread and <laughs> gardening and whatnot? Yeah. Uh, he was like that with making his own paints. Wow. You know? And we had a, uh, we had an antique letterpress printing press wow. in the living room that weighed like two tons. And I recently encountered on Twitter a, uh, a young man who, well, he's, he's like a little younger than me, maybe in his thirties or something. I forget how we stumbled upon this, but we figured out that his dad, uh, taught it at VCU, Virginia Commonwealth university, where my dad was an art professor or something like that. But anyway, that, that this, this random guy on Twitter's dad was the printmaker in Richmond that my mom uh, donated that printing press wow. to. Father died. But like, who has a two or three ton <laughs> letter press from the mid 1800s in their living room? And this was small, like it was, a, it was a house that was so dilapidated and so unsafe that it was torn down immediately oh, after wow. my dad died and we moved out on the corner of a highway. And it was uh, torn down, paved over, and now there's a, if I look on Google Maps, I've, I've never been back there, but there's a big, uh, 
like a target parking lot over top of it. Oh. So we had these like naked ladies wandering around the house, posing for these, you know, beautiful photorealistic portraits that, that my dad would do. And he had all these gadgets that he was building, 3D cameras, cool, you know, stereoscopic players. He was a big Trekkie. So we had phasers and Starship Enterprises. And this was before uh, VCR. And he was kind of an, a compulsive. Um, There's his doctor. book. I don't Art. know. If, I don't know if you. I think that's out of print, but uh, there it's still oh, available. You can buy it. Yeah, yeah. that's my dad, and yeah. that's our front yard, which is no longer there. Oh wow! That's, it was a, that's a beautiful. One of the beautiful, beautiful women that um, came in and out of our homes. But uh, so he was a big Trekkie, and every night, I, I hope my my little brother Carl watches this show so he can correct me on on my. Uh, imperfect memory but yeah our, our dad used to watch star trek every night and i remember him like shushing us because he he was always he had a tape recorder that he would put like up next to the tv so that he could do audio recordings of every episode of star trek <sighs> You're... so it's like there's genius but wow. then there's this weird sort of ocd and then he's right. like mean to the kids during dinner because he's got to record it so it's mm -hmm. it's like the beauty the nerdiness and then the wow that's kind of up all at the same time and right. that was childhood <laughs> but what's interesting I, is for I spent all a lot of time roaming the route the, the the woods and yet i still care about interesting right. interesting things and it just it's a natural extension of i guess where i'm from and i think that's great because you can both acknowledge that the 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 dna uh at the same time rejecting perhaps that life but you but you can't miss the fact that that is that that's those are your roots that's where you come. That's the flower. That's where the, the Jenny flower, <laughs> Flores, comes out yeah. of, right? Yeah. You know, it takes a long time uh, sometimes for for us to come to terms with uh, the good and the bad of where we're from. Right. So for me, you know, I, I the bad was pretty hard to miss. And yeah. I had my own, you know, it, like I spent most of my time looking back on that saying, my parents were so. It was so wrong. I was so victimized. And then I realized, um, like, they were doing the best they could. They were each doing the absolute best that they could. And I have my own issues. I, I have played my own part in all of that craziness as an adult. You know, I chose to stay in the, the situation that I described to you earlier. Um, you know, made some really good decisions in life, made some really bad ones. And like, I'm a grown ass woman now. I get to take responsibility for that. And just as I know that within myself, um, I am capable of great kindness and great cruelty, great selfishness and, and great generosity, um, you know, character defects and character assets. I, I know that my mom and dad had those same things and, and I have different tools than they have uh, to deal with all of that. So I'm, I'm, I'm just getting to the place where I can, like, I can look at my dad's paintings now mm. could for a long time. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. Or, but, or I, can, I can just really appreciate all that, like, my mom did to, uh, to raise two kids after sticking in a really horrible, abusive, isolating, it's almost like being kidnapped for her, I think. And she felt like she couldn't get out. A lot of women do. A lot, uh, definitely a lot of women at that time did. It was a very different time for women uh, who wanted to have careers. My mom was a, a copy editor. She was a publications editor um, for the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. And she did, wow. a, she did great, great work. It's where a lot of my own um, copy editing skills and love of language come from. And she was, yeah, she faced all kinds of sexual abuse and sexual harassment all her life. And she, she did her best. So it just, you know, I guess part of it is just getting older and realizing, you know, if I'm this much of a up and I'm trying this hard, maybe I can, you know, give my mom and dad some slack and just appreciate both the good and the bad of where I come from. I always say getting older, uh, the only real reward of getting older is wisdom, but not, it's so, much, so few of us actually get wisdom with age. <laughs> but you're, I think that you have a very mature and accurate point of view, which is I think we all do the best we can. And uh, it's hard sometimes to look at your parents, especially, and say they were doing the best they can or they could, yeah. right? Yeah. But if and you don't do that, you can't move on. 
Yeah. And for me too, I, um, you know, I, I've had my own lifelong struggles with, uh, alcohol and, um, drug abuse. And so for me coming to terms with the fact that like, I, you know, I had cancer and cancer is a disease and this other stuff is a disease too. And it affects everyone in the family. You know, some of the, the experiences that I've had over the last couple of years, uh, coming to terms with all of that with help, uh, has helped me come to peace, come to a place of peace and acceptance. Um, I'm not, I don't always stay there and like, I don't always exist in a state of perfect spiritual bliss, but you know, more than half the time, I don't want to kill myself anymore. Or hey, that's people, good. <laughs> <laughs> more than half the time, I don't want to kill myself or anybody else. Good. <laughs> We're talking to Jenny Jardin, internet superstar, Aww. but also very deep and, as you can tell, very interesting uh, so person. Deep. So deep. So interesting. I want to talk about Jason Calacanis when we get back. Aw, Jason. <laughs> Not many people say that when you say his name. Aw, Jason. But I want to hear about the early days at the uh, Silicon oh, cool. Alley Reporter. Okay. Uh, we're, this is a fun, this is really an interesting triangulation. I'm so glad uh, you could be here. We're also going to talk about making tortillas <laughs> because you talked me into that a couple of weeks ago and now I have a 25 pound bag of corn. Oh boy. That's big, you know. That's not yes. a, that's this big. <laughs> it came in a giant box and I said, wait a minute, how much corn did I order? <laughs> oh my God. Well, tortillas for all in a little bit. But first, a word about Blue Apron. And we like to talk about cooking. And uh, oh, yeah. Blue Apron is a really, really great thing for people who want to kind of dip their toe to begin to become a great cook. Blue Apron is named after the Blue Apron that the apprentices at the famed Cordon Bleu cooking school in Paris wear. You're an apprentice learning how to cook amazing meals, always from fresh ingredients. Even the meats and fish are fresh, not frozen. They come delivered to you in a refrigerated uh, box. And it's, oh, what I love about it, it's stuff you probably wouldn't ever think of cooking, like cumin Sichuan, Sichuan beef and noodles or southern style chicken cacciatore. I don't even know what that is. Uh, Thai green coconut curry. You, you probably, I mean, this makes my mouth water just thinking about it with sweet potato, green beans, and jasmine rice. You'd get all the ingredients, by the way, not too much, just enough ginger, just the amount you need to mince it up, just the right ingredients, a wonderful little recipe card that tells you how to make it. They have dinner for two or dinner for a family. The family plan's kind of nice because it's kid-friendly ingredients and you can get the kids involved, which I think is a wonderful idea. Look, we all want to eat wonderful fresh meals. Going out is not economical and probably not the best thing to do, but if you get home from work, who wants to go shopping? Blue Apron is a great solution. I, I always love it when I come home and I see that Blue Apron box and I know, oh, we're going to have a nice meal tonight. Less than $10 a meal. Blue Apron will send you perfectly proportioned, fresh ingredients. In fact, every box comes with a card talking about the farm from which one of the ingredients came to the tomatoes or the corn. And that's really nice, too. You get to celebrate local farms. Um, it's great for date night. You want to impress somebody, nothing better. Nothing better than Monterey Jack and bell pepper quesadillas or seared steaks and roasted potatoes. Each meal, five to 700 calories, takes about half an hour to make. Shipping is free. The menus are always new. You'll get, never get the same meal twice. This is our, uh, this is Jason. This is Jason's Blue Apron box. Look at all this. It's, oh, it's so, it's, it's wonderful. I want you to try it. We've got two meals waiting for you right now. My mouth is watering. This is hard to do this ad. I think this is my box. This looks familiar. Lemons, look at that. Here's the deal. Go to blueapron.com slash twit. Your first two meals are free. And you're going to, a whole world of cooking will open up to you. And by the way, once you make these recipes, now you know how. And you can do it again and again. And, you know, for instance, look at that. Oh, man. The, the, by the way, the beef is excellent. The fish is excellent. They've really done a nice job with this. They do have vegetarian meals, if you want. Blueapron.com slash twit opens up a world of cooking and then the next time i make it i'm going to make the tortillas by hand <laughs> blue apron thanks to you blueapron.com slash twit jenny jardin is our guest jenny flores
I looks love that. really good. I've never tried Blue Apron, but I've heard about it. It's a neat that idea. It's wonderful. You know, sometimes people try, I've tried those pre-made meals, you know, but they're yeah. just frozen and you microwave them and it's not really, it's a TV dinner for the affluent. Yep. <laughs> this is not, this is cooking. And that's really cool. They have videos on the site and they show you how to cut and mince and stuff. So it really is like a little cooking class in a box. They don't say that, but that's really what it is. A little cooking class in a box. And oh, that's I just, great. I'm making stuff. I made the other night a, uh, what was it called? Three cup Taiwan. It was a Taiwanese uh, recipe, Chinese recipe. Three cup chicken, I thought, because it's a cup of rice wine vinegar, a cup of soy, mm. uh, and a cup of sesame oil. Now, Oh. They they re they kind of rejigger it so it's not exactly sure. a cup. There it is. Taiwanese Look three cup. Oh, so good. And oh. now I've got the technique. Oh. And by the way, the house oh. fills with the the lovely Ooh, odor of Thai, Thai basil. basil and ginger and scallions sauteing Love up. It. And oh. Look at that. That looks so simple. Sometimes Isn't the best beautiful? recipes are the ones yeah. that are so simple. It is. Yeah. One of my favorite dishes is called Hainan chicken, and it. It's not too far off of this. Oh, they sent you choice some? Yeah. It's such an obscure green. I never had it. I thought, what is this? Nice. It's great. It's one of my favorites. It's, it's like little baby broccoli, sort of. It's almost like broccoli rob, sort of. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah, it's kind well, of like, it's like bok choy. That and bok choy. It's kind of like a delicate bok choy. And, you know, one yeah. of the problems I have with bok choy is it's so, so um, uh, woody. And this is like stalky. But, yeah. Uh, uh, the stalk is really, really tender like a leaf. It's so good. And I mm -hmm. never even heard of it. I'm, I'm thrilled that you've heard of it. And now that's all I ever want. It is the best thing you ever had. It's Man, incredible. One, one thing I learned in Guatemala back in those early years, um, the people that we were with were very, very poor. And it was a time when it was really, there was a lot of food insecurity there. And I, I remember hearing the phrase carne verde, green, green meat. meat. And it was like, and that's like greens. You know, you, there's always greens, like growing in a forest somewhere or by the side of the road. Gelitas, they call them in Mexico. Just, you know, some of them are semi-wild or wild. Right. But choisome would be considered carne verde. Yep. It's good for you. Oh, it's I try, so good. I try to have carne verde at every meal. Is that where you learned to cook in Guatemala? Uh, no, man. My mom was, a, was and is a great cook. Yep. And my grandmother was uh, a, a wonderful cook, and they, they were both really into... My grandmother's long gone, I never met her, but my mom uh, was not as wonderful at, at breads and what pastries kind of and carby things. Baking. She was a baker. She, she's especially good at baking. She yeah. also makes a mean moussaka. And oh, I love moussaka. I make a mean moussaka. Oh, we had moussaka that she made for... <laughs> I helped her, but we, we made a oh, nice moussaka it. for it's Christmas. It's a lamb casserole. It's so yeah. good. It's kind of like shepherd's pie for Greeks. <sighs> for so. really fat Greeks, man. Because they've got like about <laughs> it's so, a metric ton yes. of bechamel sauce. Oh, it's so sucker. good. <laughs> oh, I, have, I got some eggplants at the market this week, and I'm thinking I'm making a, a slightly lighter moussaka this week. I have to be very careful. I, wanna, I have to learn. <laughs> so I stopped baking because you know what you do when you bake? You eat. Oh, Yes. I and, do know. Uh, and uh, I've been doing this. Uh, uh, you've, I'm sure, seen the, the tartine cookbooks, the tartine oh, baking. Those are great. And it's, yeah. uh, it's crazy because, I mean, it's bad enough to bake your own bread. This stuff, you, yeah. you can't have a life because you have, to, you have to raise it for hours and then you ferment it for hours. And then and you're always tending this loaf. And then the starter is like takes over your life. Every morning and night, you're feeding this little bit of dough. And it's like for the rest of your life, that's all you think about. So but I had to. That's great. <laughs> it's so good. It's wonderful. That's. Well, look, we, but I can't I, do it because I'll eat it. And it's not good for me. Yeah. You know, I go in and out of uh, happy obsessions, in and out of yes, phases me too. with different kinds me of too. projects. Yep. But for me, um, one kind of food obsession or another has always been part of my life. Yes. You know, when, when I was younger and really suffering a lot, I had a pretty serious eating disorder. And now I get to channel that mm. fascination and obsession and the kind of comfort that uh, that food kind of represents to me. I get to channel that into a happier place. Yes. I get to think about yes. nutrition and how to raise yeah. or lower uh, risk factors for recurrence and progression of cancer. You know, I'm a breast mm -hmm. cancer survivor. Uh, I can think about what that means in terms of, you know, how many calories or, or what kind of nutrition I'm getting. 
and it it's just it's like a happier way to fuss over something. Yeah. So I'm I'm not thinking about like you know I'm I'm not vegan or paleo or or I I don't have a a food lifestyle that involves um, uh, sort of a restrictive identity label. Um, but I I like I love going to the farmers market. I love mm-hmm. growing what I can outside in my little urban home, and I love. Uh, slowly fermenting kraut. I have some kraut up in my cabinet <laughs> right now. You showed us on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, and, and like making yogurt at home, oh, making kefir at home. Uh, I have like little mushroom starter boxes that at some point I might try growing. Just uh, the, Or like sourdough starter. To me, the, those little relationships that you described with tending things that are slowly fermenting, like sourdough starter or like the crowd or kombucha or whatever it is it's like you have to believe in the future in order to do that you can't be so depressed or pessimistic or hopeless that you don't care about the future and there's something about just gently tending and nurturing to things that that then nurture you there's just something really healing about that so i the more, the more that I incorporate that into my life again after having lived um, a sleep when you die, we've got to make this startup oh, happen. Yeah. Got, got to get that blog post up. We've got to, got to get a live shot. Like all the crazy psychosis of news. Um, you know, it's a living, but it's a very hard living. And it's, it's honestly not as important to me as being happy. Good. It does seem, though... I've read books that say, uh, in fact, there was a, there's a couple of great books about bipolar disorder. Mm-hmm. Um, one, uh, 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 I'm trying to remember the name of it, uh, Fire. But her pre- premise, and I'll find it, it's Jemison. Her premise is uh, that, in fact, many of the greatest creative minds of yes. all time probably were bipolar. They had a manic phase that they were intensely, brilliantly creative yeah. which would often be followed by the darkest depression. Yes. Um, and if you medicate that away, and by the way, I'm a big believer, having mental illness in the family, yeah. of medication. But, if, but you also <laughs> want to celebrate our obsessive nature, our manic nature. These are where the real creative things happen. And it's a difficult balance. I think you seemed like you found a way. Well, I don't have bipolar disorder, but my father... Uh, I am pretty sure that he did. Yeah. Uh, he did spend some time in uh, mental institutions as well. Yeah. But but he was clearly a high functioning genius. You know. It's called Touched um, with Fire. It's by yeah. Kay Redfield Jameson, who herself is bipolar. But it, I don't mean specifically bipolar. But it, it could be obsessiveness. It could yeah. be. Uh, I think really interesting to deal with an eating disorder by transmogrifying into <laughs> an obsession with cooking and healthful creation and things you don't lose the genius you just lose the yeah. destructive part yeah well i feel like um you know, it's, it's really complicated it wasn't like one day i said i think i'll stop making myself throw up and instead make tortillas you know, it didn't, it didn't, <laughs> oh if it only it were that easy <laughs> no it, it didn't happen like no, that like of course not. i i um went through a a gentle and gradual process of recovery that helped me to deal with some of the reasons that, you know, I just hated myself and and had such a hard time managing my feelings, you know, and and understanding who I was and what I needed and all that kind of crap. And once that stuff started to sort itself out, I was able to to understand like, wow, there's stuff that I like and that I've always liked. You know, I like being in nature. I like having a garden. I like bacon bread. Yeah. I was so busy worrying about everybody else's and how I, you know, had to fuss over and fix and correct everything on the internet or everything my partners were doing wrong or everything, you know, happened in my boyfriend's family or whatever. And once I started, you know, my, my happiness and, and my well being and, and being of service to the world, like that's, that's the anchor of my life right now. And, and when you, when all the kind of crazy anxious friction starts to calm down and you and you really start to know who you are um it's just a lot more fun brush with death will do that won't it you know it will but like i've had brushes with death all my life oh that's true 
<laughs> no, I, I really have. And yeah. I don't say that like, you have no idea. No, but it didn't... I have suffered more than anybody. Yeah. But, you know, I'm just, I'm really lucky to have found yes. um, some tools that keep me, yes. you know, keep me wanting to live. Keep me wanting to live. And, and you know, the, the thing about bipolar, I learned through this process that about, I forget what the stats are, but it's like, I don't want to misquote it because somebody out there on your show will correct me. You have so many smart, uh, yeah, smart yeah. people who really know how to use the Google machine. <laughs> but uh, having a bipolar parent makes you far, far more likely to have bipolar disorder yourself right. or um, uh, depression. And in my case, I, I found as my cancer, my primary treatment for cancer was ending, you know, the, the, uh, it's very common for people who finish cancer treatment to experience intense, intense uh, depression yes. or PTSD and different kinds yes. of catastrophic mental health problems. It's it's very normal. Uh, it happened to me, and it, it was greatly exacerbated by a drug that they they put me on that I'm on for five or ten years called tamoxifen. Mm. A lot of a lot of women who have to take tamoxifen mm -hmm. uh, go off it because it causes such serious problems including for many of us, mental health problems. So for me, uh, I got to a point really, really fast where, um, you know, I, I wanted to kill myself. And I just felt like I was in this terrible, terrible quicksand that I had no idea how to get out of. And there were, there were things kind of happening in relationships and financially and all the, your life's a wreck after cancer, a yeah. fucking wreck. And all that situational stuff outside of me was real, but there was also something in my brain that was, um, you know, the brain chemistry was terribly off. T tamoxifen, let me see if I can say this accurately. It's like it has, there's a double whammy effect on the brain. So tamoxifen adversely affects brain cells directly, and it also causes in, in some of us, like I guess people who have brains the way my brain is, and a tendency for depression anyway, as I do, I have a higher risk because of my dad and right. other mental illness in the family. So if you've got if you've got that wiring, tamoxifen can also cause the the amount of circulating serotonin in the brain to be drastically, drastically depleted. So here I was walking around basically without this serotonin that my brain needed, and if that's that's like a, an important feel good chemical. So. Um, God, that's I, awful. Yeah, like the short version of what happened. I like to tell the story because I hope it will help somebody else out there. Uh, you know, I was walking around every day trying to die. And m the people around me didn't understand why all of a sudden I was like crazy or, you know, just why I looked like I was suffering so much. Uh, I, I knew enough to know that some women that I met through Twitter, through BCSM, Breast Cancer Social Media, if you look at hashtag BCSM, every Monday night, I think it's six specific, they have a chat for providers, for women with the disease, metastatic or otherwise, for their families. So I, I, I met some women there who were like, sweetheart, I hope that tamoxifen goes well for you, but this is what happened to me. And they told me horror stories, kind of like what ended up happening to me. And I was able to, uh, like this one woman, her name is Alicia Staley, she... She told me enough about what her experience was that I knew when it started happening that I should ask for help yeah, and, a, and keep asking for it until I got it. Thank goodness. So I, 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 went to, um, I went to the hospital where I got all my cancer treatment. I, I called him up and I said, hey, uh, you guys just finished saving my life and I want to end it like every day. And I think that it might be because of the drug I'm on and I really need help so that I don't die or, uh -huh, you know, uh -huh. I, like I can't function. <laughs> and they said, oh, wow, that's terrible. Uh, okay, are you in active treatment here? And I was like, I'm taking this drug that's supposed to help <laughs> prevent my, my cancer from progressing. So they said, well, we'll have, um, we'll have somebody from like, psychiatric services call you back because they have, they provide some mental health support to people who are in treatment there. So um, nobody ever called me back. And I called back again. And I, I had That's networked terrible. the way. 
I networked my way to like the desk that deals with this. And, uh, and the, and the woman on the phone, when I called a week later was very apologetic. And she's like, you know, we're really understaffed. The post-it note fell on the floor. I'm oh, so dear. sorry. It's very serious. <laughs> I'm sure you get a call back right away. So I got a call back. This very nice man, um, said, okay, come on in for an appointment. So I came in, he, he did this evaluation interview with me. Uh, we talked about what was happening. I said, well, look, you know, based on what you're describing, uh, it sounds like you're one of these cases where tamoxifen is wreaking havoc with your brain chemistry. Um, we have to, we, we can try, uh, there's, there's certain classes of drugs that help with this. We have to make sure that we get one that doesn't interfere with the enzyme in your liver that's helping process the, the tamoxifen, the life-saving drug. Um, I'm going to call your oncologist. I'm going to call your, uh, the cancer therapist that I was seeing already just to help me like continue getting through therapy because I didn't want to show up because it was so awful. Uh, and, and, you know, we'll, we'll set it a follow-up appointment for like 24 hours from now. I come back and this wonderful, empathetic, very professional man said, so good news, we figured out what drug it would probably be good to start you on. And uh, I have some ideas of some other things that you might want to try, but I can't help you. What? And I said, what do you mean you can't help me? He said, because um, the rules of the hospital state that you're not in active treatment because you're not getting chemo, you're not getting radiation, you don't currently have any surgery scheduled. Is this a health insurance issue? No, it was actually, and so I asked him, I was like, is this because insurance won't cover it? Because I'll pay cash. Like I'll find out, yeah. I, I, need, I need to not want to die. Right. I, need to, I need to not have my brain feel like it's, there's blackness inside my brain that I can't crawl out of. Uh, is a physical thing. I was feeling it oh, yeah. in my skin and everything. Yeah. It's yeah. like Rob Delaney, the comedian on, on Twitter. Uh, I love him so much. He, he wrote a beautiful piece about how, how depression feels. And I hadn't really experienced it like this before. And he was right. So anyway, long story short, this, this wonderful man said, uh, you know, when they recruited me, he was like, this is off the record. So it's, I'm kind of cheating here because it's not off the record. Well, you haven't named the hospital or the man, so no, you're all right. He's a wonderful man. When they recruited me here, we, uh, the people who began this hospital wanted to have like full service for cancer patients. And I brought all these professionals in for these different kinds of supportive uh, to, to, to help the person. Holistically not just treat the person. With evidence-based medicine for mental health. Perfect. And he said that, that was uh, some time ago. And we don't have the resources that we yeah. used to have, so there are restrictions. And I said, let me ask you something, sir. How many, how many of there are you here in this cancer ward? This is one of the biggest, most prestigious cancer centers, certainly on the West Coast, if not in the country. I said, how many are there of you? And he said, just me. Oh, my God. Just me. Wow. So he said, uh, you, should, you should try to find somebody who has experience with... Uh, issues related to like hormones and health because basically the tamoxifen it's an estrogen it's, it's, it's an endocrine yeah. endocrine blocker or yeah. endocrine therapy estrogen blocker right. it changes the amount of estrogen and progesterone in your brain in your body and your ovaries it just does a lot of weird things that are unpredictable i found someone who works with women who are going through fertility therapy, you know, where they scorch it full of all kinds of crazy hormones and they're injecting eggs back into you. That wasn't what I was going through, but it was in the same range enough that a psychiatrist was able to look at me and say, yes, he was right. This, this is exactly the drug mm -hmm. that you should try. Mm -hmm. There's also, um, some anonymous fellowships that you should look into given your life experience uh, that, that may also provide you some social support and uh, a different kind of recovery that, that you're missing. I pursued all of that reluctantly and uh, come to find out it, it all helped a whole lot. I also use pot. I also use cannabis. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that like that's a whole other conversation, but I, I, uh, I don't use drugs. I use uh, very specific forms and varieties of cannabis as a medicine to help with PTSD, to help with my... Uh, mental health issues. And it, it, there's also all kinds of promising anti-cancer effects. I don't believe that, you know, my use of cannabis will mean that uh, I live a 
long and cancer-free life because of just that one factor, but who knows, you know? It's, it's not making me any less happy or healthy. And I've, I've been able to get off um, a lot of the kind of heavy uh, pharmaceutical drugs that I was prescribed and, and lower some of the dose of the antidepressants so that, um, yeah, it just, I'm, I'm, at a, I'm in a good place. All of the chemistry seems to be working. Everybody in the food chain, my therapist, my psychiatrist, you know, the, the other help I have, everybody knows like what everybody else is doing. And I've managed to find a greater sense of peace and serenity than I ever had in my life even before cancer. So happy to hear that. Yeah, it's but cool. It is such an important story for people to hear. We live in such, it's such a contradiction. Our technology, our medical capabilities are at, on, on the one hand amazing and on the other hand, uh, we get such, I mean, this is a perfect example, horrible treatment. And uh, you have to fight, I guess you have to fight as a patient. Of course, if you're in, a, in the black slew of despond uh, and depressed, that's the last thing you're capable of doing. It's so, it's so hard to advocate for yourself yeah. when you're sick. Yeah. And when you're physically sick, you're also, you know, miserable. Right. I, I had people helping me along the Did way. You, you have a, that's what we need is an ombudsman, isn't it? Somebody to, to represent our interests. Yeah, you know, I, I, once, uh, I, I once heard of somebody, I, I think I may have interacted with somebody on Twitter who was like a, she described herself as a cancer doula. I she love it. Like a, like a midwife <laughs> for people going through cancer treatment. I love it. I, you know, that's I would, a good, I would that's take a good that business. up as a profession. Yeah. It, it would just be too re-traumatizing for me. Yeah, you don't want to do it, but... Yeah. yeah, but somebody should definitely do that. I had another. I had another thing happen really early on in my uh, uh, experience with the cancer treatment system, where like they gave me. This is when they were still trying to figure out the initial extent of my disease and what you know was I at stage four, advanced stage four, or stage zero, stage one, stage two, and what kind of treatment and where is the cancer? They gave the wrong scans. Oh to me and to my oh. surgeon. And it wasn't just another patient, it was like a guy. Aye, who aye, had, aye. You know, something wrong with his junk maybe. <laughs> I didn't even have the same part. I don't see a breast anywhere in there. Yeah, yeah, so there, there's a whole nother long wow. and funny story to share about how like some hackers and Twitter helped me find an open source uh, app that would allow me to open the file myself without a viewing station at the hospital and that's cool. That's pretty, nobody wow. wants to deal with that when you're trying to figure out if you're dying or not. But I, I had just enough support throughout, right. and I, I feel like my, you know, inquisitive journalism blogger experience helped me network my way and advocate for myself um, through a system that is so daunting. And if you don't, like, if you don't have just enough knowledge to know what you're not getting that you need, you're you're gonna get lower quality care. Yes, money is a big part of it. Like I'm, I'm broke as a result of yeah. all of that. Yeah. And the, I, I wasn't rich when I was going through it. So it's, it's a lot of it is, money is a big factor in the quality of healthcare that you get in America. But the ability to understand how the system works, to advocate for yourself, and to ask from support from people who are able to give it. Those are things that don't involve cash that can help save your life. There's a big difference between having crappy surgery, like from a half-assed surgeon at a bad hospital, <laughs> and having the best surgery from the best guy at the best That's hospital. It doesn't difference. mean that you're going to have a perfect outcome. No. Like, I suffer physically every day because of the surgery and treatment that I had. I have mm. chronic pain issues that are a big deal for mm. me every day. The cannabis helps with that. I get a special kind of scar massage therapy that helps with that. But like, I'm probably way better off than if I'd had a surgeon like who hadn't done thousands of these right. and wasn't the best in his field. Right. BCSM, Breast Cancer Social Media Community is bcsmcommunity.org. And these women are real heroes. Having, a, having that kind of support, this is one area where technology really does make a difference because you can have Huge. a community that is not geographically uh, proximate. You can, you can find people all over the world uh, who, and you can get such great support and information too. We are at least more empowered 
yeah. um, to, to deal with this. We're talking I, with I, developed, I was just going to say that the relationships that I developed through BCSM are kind of like, um, you know, and if you're familiar with 12 step programs, yep. it's kind of like having a sponsor almost. Nice. These were women who in many cases were just a, a few steps ahead of me yeah. or maybe many steps ahead of me, or maybe like they were just diagnosed just a little bit before me and they've already gone to like the first radiation appointment and they can tell you how it feels or what it sounds like or, or when you're most likely to have a meltdown. Right. <laughs> and by the way, it's after the treatment ends. You know, there are communities like this for so many things, for, for your being a first time parent, for um, testicular cancer for men, and it, it's really worth seeking out those communities. Uh, yeah. You know, I'm a loner, I hate people, but uh, there are times when you really need uh, the support of people around you. And now, you know, I think, you know, for a long time that was your church, um, that was, you know, but, uh, but in this day and age, uh, it might be somebody in Sweden, uh, and it's somebody you meet on the internet. We're talking to Jenny Jardin. She is a journalist. She is an inspiration. Uh, she leads life in public, maybe a little more public than you thought today. Thank you, Jenny, for being so public. <laughs> We're going to take a break. I still want to ask about Calacanis, but first okay. got to talk about my doorbell. Yes. Uh, crazy, but I love this doorbell. Who loves their doorbell? Your doorbell is just some a button on the front door. Somebody pushes, and maybe you hear a ding-dong inside. Uh, up till now, the only people I knew who loved their doorbell had funny music playing from it. This is so much better. This is the Ring Video Doorbell. First of all, I never hear the doorbell, so I was really happy. Just th and what this does, by the way, it works with your existing uh, wiring. So I just took the old silly button off, and uh, there were two wires coming out of the door jam. Uh, they give you all the instructions, all the tools, everything you need to do the installation. I'm no handyman, believe me, but I was able to do this myself. And uh, now you've got a new shiny new doorbell, but with some interesting shiny new capabilities. It's Wi-Fi enabled. It connects to your Wi-Fi. Still rings the chimes in your hall, of course, but now rings the chimes on your smartphone, on your tablet. <laughs> Everything in the house rings. And even when I'm at work, it rings. There's a camera there, very nice wide angle camera. There's also a microphone and speakers. So you can answer the door when somebody rings a doorbell. I didn't know this, but they say 95% of all uh, burglaries occur during the day, and the bad guy rings your doorbell to see if you're home, and then if you don't answer, he, go, he goes in the back door and breaks in and comes, gets your stuff. There he is. You can see. That's a bad guy, you can tell. Yeah. Uh, you, all you have to do is press the button, even if you're at work, and say, hey, I'm in the other room. Can, uh, what can I do for you? And they leave. They say, oh, no, nothing. So right there, it's huge. But you also have a motion detector. So when people come and go in your, uh, in your area, you can, you can see that. You can go back and look. Now, you, you, they give you the first, I think, month of this for free. You can subscribe to it, $30 a year, and it records everything. So if I look at my, uh, my smartphone or my, it could be Android or iOS, I can see everybody who's gone and come and gone. So my daughter who comes, sometimes comes in in the middle of the night, I can say, Abby, did you come in at 3 a.m. last night? She said, how'd you know? Well, I got the video to prove it. You'll never miss a ring, a ding ding. You'll never, you'll, you'll never, I mean, it's security, it's convenience, and it's $10 off when you go to ring.com slash triangulation. Time Magazine named it one of the top 10 gadgets of last year. It is, I love it. I love the ring doorbell. There's a funny story because, uh, uh, Richard Branson now is a big investor. They just raised, I think, $28 million with a lead from Richard Branson of uh, Virgin. Apparently, the way he found out is somebody was visiting him on Necker Island, and ding, 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 on the smartphone. They took out the smartphone. Here they are in the Caribbean and answered the doorbell, and Branson said, what's that? What are you doing there? And he said, well, that's my ring doorbell. He said, oh, can I find out more about that? It is so cool. Find out more about it. Ring.com slash triangulation. $10 off. It's a way of letting them know you heard about this on triangulation, which we appreciate, and you'll save a little bit too. Ring, R-I-N-G dot com slash triangulation. I love my Ring video doorbell. Jenny Jardin is our guest. She's a journalist. You, of course, read her on Boing Boing. She has a Yeti pillow that's uh, unique. She's going to teach me how to make my own tortillas because I went out and I bought 25 pounds of corn, thanks to you. And Mrs. Whale's Lime or something like that? Something weird? Are you muted? You're muted, Jenny. Unmute her. 
There we go. I, so few people ever tell me that. Yeah, everybody. You're making everybody in the world. Yeah, mute. Mm. Mute, Jenny. There's a button, you know. Nobody ever tells me. <laughs> Please, speak, speak more. I want to hear more. So yeah. Jason Calacanis hires you uh, in your 20s to work yeah. for his first publication, The Silicon Alley Reporter. How did you even run into him? I think this is the way it happened. Uh, I I was working at a law firm. I, I had my first like serious enterprise technology job at a, a law firm in Los Angeles called Latham and Watkins. Were you like an uh, uh, IT person? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I was in, uh, uh, what, what was it called? It was like enterprise support. It was, you know, basically tech support for how'd a really you, big law firm. How do you know how to do that? Living in Guatemala and everything. Not like I had worked in, uh, I think like my first job with computers was when I was in my teens in ah, San Francisco. And I was, uh, I had like a scholarship to one year to the San Francisco Art Institute. And when that scholarship ran out, I didn't have the kind of adult support and guidance right. that I needed to secure more funding or figure out a way to stay in school. So I ended up dropping out. Uh, what were you studying? What kind of art? Uh, painting and printmaking, which Jeez. is what my mom and dad did. I actually wanted to go to journalism school, but I got a uh, full ride scholarship. Nice. I posted a full ride for a year and it was nice. an expensive school. It, it is a very expensive, school. but a good school. As yeah, somebody yeah, so who like you grew up with the uh, smell of linseed oil, and we didn't have uh, we didn't have a giant letterpress in the living room. We had looms. Wow, really? <laughs> My mom's a weaver and a silk screener, oh. and uh, so I understand very much. And I think and I cherish it and value it, yeah. growing up in that environment. And uh, and because really, in fact, I oh. remember once saying foolishly, "I only want to know artists." Yeah. Then I found no, out, you know what? Everybody has the <laughs> yeah, capability. Everybody's an artist in some form. It's just the media is very right. It's true. It's true. So you didn't get to live me? your dream as a painter. I, well, you asked me something important. I want to know how you met Jason. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We keep we keep going around Jason and not talking about Jason. I uh, was working in Latham and Watkins. I had I had like uh, uh, wrangled my way into a series of web design jobs when the web was very very young, and I worked in a web services firm. In San Diego County, I moved to San Diego for a while, uh, and uh, like it was uh, hard, thankless work, uh, and it was like a sweatshop. And God. I thought that maybe it would be cool to have like a better paying job where there was more structure. So I learned just enough about enter enterprise IT and VPNs and you know encrypting communications between like DAO. And the lawyers defending it in the Bhopal case, it was like wow. that, that level of legal wow. stuff was going on at that firm. Wow. It was, they were a big firm that always defend the very, very big bad guys. <laughs> uh, that must have been fun. You know, it was a very, it was a very sexist, very hostile right. environment for a young woman who, you know, let's face it, like a lot of us kind of lie and cheat our way into jobs sure. a little bit. We're and then we look on the job. Yeah. Everybody does this. Yeah. And when you're a, when you're a young woman, uh, older and more established men in that IT environment, uh, they know what oh, you're doing, and yeah. they're very very hostile, and they yeah. hate you. Yeah. So I, I experienced terrible Ugh. terrible on the job harassment, gender, you know, sexual harassment on on the job, and um, was miserable there. I imagine you though and, looking a little bit like uh, Elizabeth Salander, the girl with the dragon <laughs> tattoo. I wasn't that cool looking. Oh, I, shoot. It's just, yeah. <laughs> but, but so anyway, um, I, I think around that time, there was a lot of cool stuff happening in L.A. The first Internet bubble hadn't really happened yet. Uh, the Internet was such a brand new thing. And, and there was like, uh, what was it? I don't know. It was like some big design show or something that was happening in L.A., one of those big annual events. It was like SIGGRAPH, SIGGRAPH maybe or something. Yeah, yeah. I, I think maybe it was like a at SIGGRAPH that I met Jason Calacanis or something like that. He he was uh, hosting a forum that was about some internet thing. I forget even what year this must have been, 90 something. And uh, uh, yeah, like I, I came up to him afterwards and said, hey, I think your little Silicon Alley reporter zine is really cool. 
you know, if you ever want somebody to write some articles about what's happening in the L.A. tech scene, uh, you know, I, I, I love what you're doing. And we became friends and I started contributing stuff and I would write at, while I was at my miserable job collecting my paycheck, which wasn't entirely honest, but whatever they were being to me. <laughs> <laughs> you and, were doing the uh, best you can, I'm sure. Yeah, I was. Yeah. And uh, I ended up uh, becoming, uh, and you know, an editor with him, a regular contributor. And at one point he just said, why don't you, why don't you just leave your job and just come on board full time. And I really need somebody to help me put together these events. I'd had experience with a, like putting together fine arts tours for a small travel agency. It was one of my early, you know, computer jobs in San Francisco. And so I knew something about creating curated experiences for people, like uh, experiences that could cost a lot of money, but where everything is taken care of and you're providing people with a kind of a tour, a kind of a packaged experience. And as it turned out, I was very good at that. And I, I, I worked with Jason very closely. We had a very small team. It's a lot like Boing Boing where uh, people didn't really take us seriously at first. We were very small. A lot of hard, hard, hardworking people did. Like Jason has uh, relatives to this day who are in the restaurant industry or in uh, work as first responders, you know, fire police in New York City. So he was like, we need security. I'll just get my brother. I'll get my brother to do security. He's, he's kind of, you know, That's Jason. New York, New, York, New York Police Department. Yep. I think his, his brother is NYFD. But then he's like, we're going to need some more d'oeuvres. We only got, you know, $2,500 for meals on these two days. Uh, my brother Josh. <laughs> he can make some sushi. Or like their dad was a restaurateur, I think. So, you know, we need yeah, a place to hold the opening night dinner. My dad, he's got this friend. <laughs> and God bless him, you know, Jason. You, people get mad at Jason for all kinds of shit, but you can't get mad at him for not having earned it and built, a, built it himself yeah. in those days. He really, really did. And it was a very exciting, very wonderful thing to be a part of. I was miserable for much of the time because I was working very hard. He works his, uh, he very, works his people hard. There's no doubt about that. very demanding boss. Yep. And his goal was not to make you happy and comfortable. You know, his goal right. was to make money right. and to, you know, be the, um, like, the kingmaker. Right. And right. he became that person. And Silicon Alley Reporter became that yeah. publication. Yeah. And we made good money while, you know, really bootstrapping the production. So I learned a lot of good things out of that experience. And, you know, we had, oh, man, I mean, I can remember one of those dinners. It was right after Josh Harris's We Live in Public. Yes. Uh, Josh no, lived with Jason for a while. Josh lived with yeah. Jason, and uh, I think they remain friends today. I, I, so. I certainly feel very friendly towards Josh to this day. He's a very interesting character. And it was right after Josh and his live-in online girlfriend had, had broken up spectacularly. On camera. Camera. And <laughs> you guys can watch the movie. There's it's a, a there's really a great movie, yeah. Great movie. So it was right after that. We were about to launch a a big event in New York City, and we had this dinner. And Sergey Brin and Larry Page were two of the guests at the dinner. They arrived, you know, a little little later. Like dinner was mostly over, and people were having drinks. And I remember the first thing that Sergey said when he came in. He was like, "I can't even remember that woman's name right now, but Josh's girlfriend." Um, he's like, "Is." Is she here? <laughs> oh, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, she's here. So Sergey and Larry wanted to be seated next to her. And the next thing I know, like all the vodka's gone and <laughs> Sergey is standing on his head and doing circus tricks oh, on the on the table. My God. And now this is early days, right? They're not world famous yet. Oh man, this must have been like ninety eight or yeah. something, ninety seven. Yeah. And Google was just you know, it was a good search engine. Yeah. But it was like the upstart search engine yeah. that was going to overtake Hotwired. Yeah. How fun. You must have so many stories like that. Many, you know, and, and cool people like Shaq and Jimmy Page, Ed Koch. Uh, but I there's think one three people you don't normally hear in a sentence together. 
Yeah, Shaq, and, and, Jimmy Page, and, and Mayor Ed Koch. And like Sean Fanning from Napster. And let's throw in Sean Fanning just to make it more fun. Yeah. A lot of, lot of weird people. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. So the last event that I did with Jason, and I think Jason will remember this very well, and uh, Gordon Gould, who was uh, a, a business partner of Jason's back then, was an event just outside New York City that was going to be about, you know, kind of the, the – it was like Silicon Alley – what was it? 2001. I don't know. Anyway, it was like the spring of 2001 or the summer of 2001. And we, one cool thing that we were doing with the events at that time was a lot of, a lot of the content was about internet business, but a lot of it was about bigger stuff in the world. And that was during a time where everybody was so rabid about making money online mm. that the bigger stuff didn't always like people didn't always want to be in the room when you were talking about that other stuff. So one of the other weird, you know, um, uh, sessions for the intellectuals in the crowd was with, I, I remember I booked this with Hussein Ibish, the man who is at the time, the head of the council on American Islamic relations and this unknown, you know, nobody diplomat named L Paul Bremer who was talking about this obscure figure in the Middle East that uh, that intelligence was very concerned about at the time, mm. named Osama bin Laden. Mm. And the, the session was basically about increased surveillance, increased uh, probing of Muslim American communities by um, federal intelligence in uh, an effort to get a hold on emerging threats in the Mideast, one of whom was this guy named Osama bin Laden, who was tied to previous terrorist incidents, the bombing of the coal and, and so on. Every, right. Everybody knows these stories now. But back then, we couldn't get anybody to stay in the seats. Yeah. So there was, like, there was like a thing on how to get early stage angel funding or something next door. I remember Hussein Ibish and El Paul Bremer were on stage arguing about how much surveillance, like, is it okay to surveil mosques? In, in like Dearborn, Michigan, with just regular moms and dads and babies going to worship, how much of that is okay? And I remember Bremer talking about bin Laden with this really intense sense of like gravitas and reserve and urgency that only somebody like Bremer could convey in that, in that very, uh, very restrained, very polished way that you would expect an ambassador to, to have. Anyway, everybody walked out. And a few months later, Osama bin Laden, everybody knew his name. Yeah, everybody knew his name. September 11th. Yeah. So it, it was such a fascinating time. And uh, I, I remain friends with Jason to this day, even though we haven't worked together since then. I have you know, watched what he's doing with great interest. We've had our ups and downs, Jason and I. But you know what? You can't, you can't stay mad at him. And, he's such, and I love him. Yeah. you got to love his energy, his drive. His sense of humor. You just, he's, you're, if you're, if you can have people like that in your life, even though they may make you insane, hmm. it's great because they hmm. stimulate you. They, they get you going. You know, there's a saying that somebody taught me last year that I, I try to use every day. And it, I think it applies to friendships. Take what you like, leave the rest. Yeah. I don't have to, my Rolodex isn't full of like, friends who are okay and ex-friends <laughs> that I hate. It's like, you know, there's there's people who I, I'm very close to that on at any given moment I might they might be doing something that really bothers me or that I find unacceptable. But you take what you like, you leave the rest. We're talking to Jenny Jardin. She's the uh, one of the co founders of Boing Boing, a journal of wonderful things, which has for more than a decade now uh, kind of enlivened the internet and it's it, whenever i want to just laugh feel good be challenged learn i go to boingboing.net and i go yeah and cory doctorow and mark fraunfelder and i actually want to ask you how that started we, we got to wrap this up i it's gone we i'm wasting too much of your time we're oh gonna, no you're not this gonna, isn't wasted time spent with friends is fun. never wasted. it's really fun we're, we'll have some final thoughts in just a bit and i want to ask about boing boing and i want to talk about wow because wow's coming up wow wow but first, a word from Wealthfront. Uh, you know, we're geeks. We like geeky things, right? And uh, sometimes people like us look at the stock market. They look at investments. They look at uh, saving for retirement and think, well, this can be solved algorithmically, programmatically. 
If only I had the time to do it. Some of us get a little cocky, start day trading, learn lessons fast. You got to save. You got to save for retirement. You got to save to buy that house, that future. You got to save. Everybody knows that. And if you save money, you can't just l let it sit in a bank account somewhere. You can't bury it in your mattress. You got to invest. Now, do you have the time to manage your invest investments, to pay attention, to do it actively? Maybe not. Maybe you hire an advisor to do that. You know the advisor is going to take between 1% and 3% of your total dollar every year, plus hidden fees for transactions and all sorts of charges. And pretty soon, that money you're making is disappearing. It's getting whittled down. Wealthfront is a clever way to do this. For one quarter of 1% a year, 25 basis points, and there are never any fees, no hidden fees, zero commissions, no additional charges of any kind. Wealthfront uses very sophisticated technology, we love, we love that, to do this investment and does stuff, very interesting stuff like tax loss harvesting and direct indexing that would be hard for an individual to use. Wealthfront is, is run by and based on books by some of the smartest People, people like Burton Malkiel, who wrote the, I, which I read this years ago and was just blown away, A Random Walk Down Wall Street, maybe you've read it, uh, or The Elements of Investing, Charles Ellis Winning the Loser's Game. These guys have encapsulated really deep insight into how the markets work and written software that will, with your help, make your investments sing. In fact, they are doing so well, they've increased the size of the investments 20 times over the last two years. They are now up to $2.6 billion in assets. And it's because of these very sophisticated techniques they're using. This is for, for your personal savings, your joint savings, your retirement. You can do it all at Wealthfront. But here's the deal. You don't have to take my word for it. Go right now to Wealthfront.com slash triangulation. They're going to walk you through a simple questionnaire that will gauge your risk tolerance, your time frame, that kind of thing, and, and give you a sample customized allocation for you, a portfolio, the portfolio they would invest if you were to give them money. Now, you can start with $500. That's the minimum investment. But just for Twit listeners, if you sign up to invest today, Wealthfront is going to give you your first $15,000 entirely free of charge forever. So forget a quarter of a point. This is zero points. But even uh, even with one quarter of 1% a year, you're, you're getting great, a great investment tool. Uh, for And I want to emphasize this long term. This is for saving for your future. Wealthfront.com slash triangulation. And you, it's nice because you don't have to worry about it. You just let it grow. For compliance purposes, I have to tell you, Wealthfront Incorporated is an SEC-registered investment advisor. Brokerage services are offered through Wealthfront Brokerage Corporation, member FINRA and SIPC. This is not a solicitation to buy or sell securities. Investing in securities involves risks, and there is the possibility of losing money. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Please visit Wealthfront.com to read their full disclosure. Wealthfront.com slash triangulation. Try it right now. Get that free portfolio. Jenny Jardin, our guest. How did you meet? Did you? So Mark Fraunfelder had a zine, like a paper zine called Boing Boing for, for some time, I think, right? Yes, that's right. Mark and his wife and creative partner, Carla Sinclair, uh, they began Boing Boing 25 years ago. Wow. Yeah. And it was a, a printed zine. They both had other jobs. I, I, you know, they both worked at Wired for a while. And this was just something that they did on their own time. It was a printed paper zine during a time, you know, leading out from the whole hardcore punk publishing revolution where, um, you know, that was like it, it, it was a relic of pre-internet weirdness. You know, the, those of you who are watching this show, hang on, I'm trying to get my camera straight again. That's all right. Those of us who are watching, those of you who are watching this show who are significantly younger than me uh, will be interested to know that back in the 80s and 90s, people who enjoyed weird offbeat things really had to work at connecting with each other. So zines were a big way to do that. We didn't have Facebook. We didn't have the internet. Right. We didn't right. have triangulation or the live chat room that's streaming right now as, as we do this taping. Uh, By Mark, the way, they love you. I well, thank you. I'm not, the room. I'm not looking you. at it because I would be too self-conscious. It's a very good idea not to look at it. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, she's but, fat. She's ugly. No, she's no, no. You know, I want to say, <laughs> well, I'll give you an example. This is from Jean Period. I don't know how you sell it. G I M period, maybe. Period. Jenny is beautiful inside and out. Amazing life journey so far. You haven't even seen the inside of my. <laughs> software, so I, I sure. I showed you the x-rays of my intestines. I yet. sure. <laughs> no, hey, hey, that's next. I okay. sure hope you'll bring Jenny back more often. She's really sharp and super cool. That is so are, nice. Yeah. For the chat it's room, like, it's amazing because wow. you're right. They can be harsh. <laughs> I, I They're honest. Like a little hug from the internet. Oh, internet hug. Yeah. Uh, Where were we? Mark Fraunfelder, who is yeah, another Mark guy who I just love and I want to hug every time I talk to right. him. So Mark and Carla started this zine during a time when zines were a very revolutionary way to connect with other weirdos uh, in ways that weren't really driven by profit. So it was just a just a fun hobby. Uh, and they were doing that for a long time. Eventually it became too burdensome, too costly to continue publish as continue publishing as a print zine. And they turned it into a website. And Mark, uh, I think it became a collaborative blog when he needed to go on vacation. Uh -huh. And a regular contributor, a guy who kept sending in tips all the time, whose name was Corey Doctorow, he asked Corey if Corey would cover for him when he went on vacation. And Corey was uh, prolific as he is still to this day. Love in, Corey, in, one of my other, one of the smartest people. Every yes. time I talk to Corey, I feel so dumb. <laughs> Do you have that experience? Because I'm just like, oh, okay. I just sit back and go, 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 go. Leo, I spent so much of my life feeling like I was dumb that I try not to do that now. But I do think that Corey is very <laughs> intelligent. So I'm smart. Very excited about He's got this new book that he just announced. I just had a screenplay option by, I think, Paramount. I love seeing my partners become successful yeah. in things inside and outside of Boing Boing. We're just loosely knit enough that we get to, um, you know, we don't get too irritated with each other because we can go do things that we have complete creative freedom over outside of Boing Boing. It, it's just wonderful and vibrant. We didn't plan it this way, but it worked out this way. So Mark and Carla had been running Boing Boing as a zine. It turned into a blog. It turned into a collaborative web blog. Pasco, I think, was after David Paskovitz came after Corey. He was a longtime friend of Mark, as I recall, and I had met Pesco. Uh, I think he actually came to a uh, Jason Calacanis event that I uh, produced. And, uh, you know, gradually the, the tribe grew beyond that. Eventually we became a business, but it didn't originate as a business. It's been a, it's been around, Boing Boing has been around for 25 years and like as late as I think 2007 or eight, we were arguing at our partner meetings about, do we really want to run a business? <laughs> is this really a business or is this just, you know, like some kind of interesting art project that we care about more than we care about the business? And eventually we realized it's really great to have a lifestyle business that keeps a roof over your head you know, keeps tortillas in the tortilla maker and maybe pays for your kid's college education or for your cancer treatment. And there's a way to do both. And so our struggle has always been around how do we have a healthy business mm. and a thing that we want to do so much, we can't wait to get out of bed to do. And if somebody came along as they have and offered us millions of dollars for the business, we'd say, how much is it worth to pay me to step away from the thing that I love most in the world? Or to, to give up creative control. It's, so it's ad-supported right now, right? Yeah, I mean, we do display ads. We have uh, sponsored content where a given uh, advertiser will, will pay us a certain amount of money to produce features that are related thematically or in some way to their to their brand. We've done it, like, with Mercedes-Benz. We had a... And nice. with Ford, we've done cool stuff with Ford. We do events, too. We have an upcoming event, uh, Weekend of Wonder. We are... At, at, on the day of this taping, I think we are four days away. <gasps> Friday. It's getting ex it's September 18th through the 20th yeah. at the Mission yeah. Inn. I'll be there, and uh, you know, Leo, we have a special in studio guest here at Shenny Headquarters who will always be there, or is, rather, also be there. Don't tell me uh, is Chappie here? <gasps> Hi, Chappie! You came home. Chappie and. Uh, my mysterious boyfriend who would rather not be on camera. <laughs> we, you said that when, he was on, when you were on Twitter, and I certainly honor anybody 
And, and I often say this to my family and friends. I chose to be in public. doesn't mean you have to be. That's right. And that's I think that's really great. Good. But is, is it a name that we would recognize this mysterious boyfriend or not? Depends. <laughs> Depends on where you've been hanging out, Leo. I love the mystery of it. Anyway, on with the Weekend of Wonder. Okay, so Weekend of Wonder, September 18th through the 20th, uh, wow.boingboing.net. Mark Frauenfelder and Jason Weisberger, uh, our publisher and founder, co-founder, have really been the ones driving this and putting it together with uh, a publication group called Baby Tattoo. <laughs> so this guy named Bob Self from Baby Tattoo has put on other weird, cool events at... Uh, the Mission Inn in Riverside, uh, a, a really cool 19th century resort in Southern California that's a little bit like the Winchester Mystery House. I think that's up in the Bay Area. And it's just this really cool Spanish-style architecture with all kinds of hidden passageways Fun. and catacombs and stuff. We're going to have magic, recreational lock picking, so, you know, get to know your sourdough starter. <laughs> Chappie's going to do a little tap dance. We're going to have Andrew Main, who's uh, a, great a, a don't yeah. trust Andrew Main yeah. uh, star on uh, uh, on TV. Great magician. We're going to have uh, it's, uh, stars of Adventure Time there. A guy named John Edgar Park, who's with Disney, who's an Imagineer, who's uh, I think he's actually doing the recreational lock picking workshop. Fun. It's basically a lot of cool, like fun, family-friendly stuff that we tend to blog on Boing Boing uh, in person. And here, I actually just learned this today. I haven't been to the Mission Inn. Mark and Jason have spent a lot of time there. Oh, David Peskovitz is also going to come to the event. Oh, nice. And we're, we're still working on getting Corey there. He's didn't, just moved. Didn't Corey move back to L.A.? No, he just moved back to L.A. Oh. He's got all this stuff going on. I, I, we really want to see him and Allison Posey there. I know. Uh, so I'm not sure if he's going to make it, but but like we're all bringing our families, our dogs. Nice. I might acquire a sheep or a goat, you know, because <laughs> it's like other women, you know, they bring their Gucci or their Chanel or their Prada. You bring I just, livestock. I want to bring livestock. Yep. So I will bring something and it may be livestock <laughs> and you should come. It's going to be so fun. And limited to 100 people. So very small. It's going to be this is like Ted meets Burning Man. I don't know how to describe this. You know, though, I hope this becomes a yearly event because it really sounds great. I can't make it this weekend, but yeah. if it does become a yearly event, I will be there next week, next yeah, year. Yeah, uh, Leo, I actually think that, uh, you know, we just want to, we, like, we kind of try to do this stuff a day at a time, you know? We, yeah. we want to see what this turns I, into. I honor that, the, too, about the, you guys. The magical thing about working on the Internet that we've learned is that once you relinquish the idea that you have yep. to know everything in advance and have to have control, the magic can happen. Yes. We want to really have our together and have a beautiful yes. flawless flawless event and then let our community our crowd our people who have decided to sacrifice their time and their money to come join us we just want them to have an awesome time and to teach us what the next one should be like and the last thing i want to say is that our our rooms are like all around a central courtyard this is what i just learned and uh the courtyard is ours to use oh dear four seven so there could be <laughs> Jason Calacanis could come out there that and sounds, have a damn poker game. Sounds like trouble. <laughs> yeah, we have an all-night poker game. And, and Jason just told me over Slack earlier, he's like, Shenny, when you want to go to sleep, you're just going to have to shut your door. Oh. And we are, like, Jason he... and Pesco and Mark oh, and I and man. hopefully Corey and, and my mysterious boyfriend. If you come to this event, you will actually probably meet my mysterious boyfriend. You might even learn his name, and you'll probably meet Chappie, too. Nice. But we're, we're all going to be our, your hosts there. It's going to be really nice. fun. I can't wait. Loquacious in our chat room says she'd love Jenny to be a neighbor. I could invite over for tea and crumpets and hang out shooting the breeze. Seems Aww. so easy to talk to. <laughs> I thank you for hanging Aww. out with... I don't have any tea and crumpets. We have virtual tea and crumpets. <laughs> but thank you for hanging out with us today. Oh, thank you, Leo. It made my day. Oh, and I'm so going to go... Um, I, I, I actually think I'm going to go make some tortillas now. <laughs> Damn you. Now, I, now, let I, me just ask. Okay, you showed us your press. I got the same press. Yeah. Your, your, you said your mamacita said put plastic bags on the uh, top and bottom. Right. So after you assemble the press, Leo, I suggest that you, you know, take some plastic wrap or a little plastic bag from the produce section at the store and just kind of wrap it and tie it real tightly around the top and the bottom. And that way the tortilla won't stick and you don't have to worry about nice. oil, flour. Really cool. 
Um, yeah, over the weekend, I uh, did. I prepared nishtamal. I I took the dried corn, uh, two cups corn, six cups water, two tablespoons of the cal lime, calcium carbonate white powder. I got it all. Put, okay. Yep, put it in a pot. Brought it to a slow boil. Yeah. Put the top on. Left it there overnight. Well, it sounds like pozole then, or something. It is how you make. It's the same thing. You're nishtamalizing corn, and in the morning. You uh, put it in a, a, a strainer and then you rub it between your hands under running water and then you soak it in water in various changes of water until all the debris right. and that highly alkaline water right. rub off. Uh, and, and then you can grind it in corn or you can uh, cook it into pozole or you can grind it with lard or another fat like coconut oil and make tamales. Oh, baby. Yeah. Will you make a YouTube video or something? Just show us how to do that. <laughs> Or yeah, maybe so come I'm back and we'll you, have a cooking class. Leo, everybody from like my cancer therapist to, you know, the love of my life here to my mom to our video producer to my partners is saying do a cooking show. And right now, this is just my happy little thing that I do, but eventually it will become something. Well, I'll be watching. We'll all be watching. Cool. Jenny Jean well, I can't wait to invite you over for dinner, Leo. Thank you so much you're, for having me on. Chappie says hi. You're a doll. So great Aww. to see you. Boing, boing, <laughs> dot net. Uh, thank you for being here, Jenny. Thank really you. a pleasure. Take it's care. It's really an honor. Bye bye. Oh, we do triangulate. Oh, we do triangulation every every uh, Monday, 11 a.m. Pacific. That's at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1800 UTC. If you watch live, you never know what you'll see. You certainly see the uncensored version of the show, which is great. We might have to bleep it a little bit uh, for download later because we like to make it family friendly. But I love Jenny's enthusiasm, and certainly uh, if she wants to s say anything she wants, it's okay with me. Uh, if you don't get to watch live and be in our chat room, well, you can always watch After the Fact for any of our shows. Uh, they're all available at twit.tv. This show is available at twit.tv slash TRI. You can also go uh, to youtube.com slash triangulation, and you can download it. Subscribe, really. That's the best idea from iTunes or whatever podcatcher you use and make sure you get each and every show wouldn't we should do jenny's kitchen i have a feeling she has she has people in la that can have her help her do that but boy i'll be watching thanks for your attendance thanks for watching leo laporte the tech guy the jenny fan thanks for joining us we'll see you next time on triangulation bye-bye